Welcome to another Zoom. Our special guest is from California. Give me your location again. Ventura. Ventura. You're looking at one of the most famous guys, and I really mean that, Dr. George Barner, uh, is often called the most quoted person in the Christian church today. I have to agree with that because I've been in, you know, different churches and heard the pastor open his message or whatever, and he'll many times in the message quote your name and what was said. So what does that feel like? I mean, you better get it right. And obviously, somebody is going to do some checking on what the quote meant and what you said. So you're pretty scrutinized. Yeah, which is great. You know, I mean, the, the whole thing about being a researcher is that you want to tell the truth. And the reason that we do the research is to figure out what is the truth. And so to have other people take that and amplify it to a larger audience is a real blessing for me. So uh, I'm pleased when they do that. I'm embarrassed when they do that. I'm humbled when they do that. I'm scared when they do that. <laughs> and the reason I'm scared is because I've been in a number of churches where they didn't know I was there and they were allegedly quoting me and they will talk about something I've never even done research on and they'll attribute it to me. Oh my God. So I know that happens a lot. A good friend of mine was uh, George Gallup, uh, you know, before he died, the, the eminent yes. pollster. And I asked George, I said, you go through the same thing. You know, how do you deal with it? He said, look, you know, it, it's nice that they care about the information. It's a bummer when they get it wrong, but you know, you just have to keep putting out truth and, you know, praying that it'll be used properly. So uh, that's kind of the approach I take. Now, give me your background. Uh, married how many years? Oh, gosh, I should have uh, prepared for this. Uh, I, let's see, we were married in 1978. So what's that? 43 years. And you, and you uh, have an, yeah. a family. And tell me about your family. Yeah, uh, we have three daughters, uh, all from different countries, two from Guatemala, one from Russia. We have three grandchildren, ages seven, five, and three. And... Uh, you know, we all live in the same area, which is wonderful. We're, wow. we're pleased about that. And, uh, you know, we, we, I started out on the East Coast. Uh, I was born in New York City, uh, what, raised what in that area. Uh, Manhattan. Okay. Yeah, and then moved out to Long Island, and then eventually moved to New Jersey, Princeton, New Jersey, and then uh, went to college, went to grad school, and decided I'd had one winter too many. And uh, we, we moved out to California. Yeah, right. Yeah. What, what, what school did you go to? Princeton? Uh, uh, under, no, un, no. When you grow up in Princeton, the last place you want to go because your parents are there is Princeton. Sure. So uh, went to Boston College as an undergrad and then went to Rutgers University for a couple of grad degrees. Were you a student that enjoyed school? Did it come hard or come easy? You know, it, it, it's funny. In, in high school, I couldn't wait to get out of school. I couldn't stand it. Yeah. I went to college and it scared me to death because I hate to fail. Yeah. And so I got there and I saw a lot of other smart people that were working really hard. And that kind of scared me into doing the studying. And lo and behold, I found I really enjoyed it. Wow. And so, you know, after graduating as a with a bachelor's, went right on to get, uh, you know, a few grad degrees and my wife finally had to put a stop to it because I was going to go on and get more. And she said, no, that's enough. You've got enough. Do something with it. So, Were you taught in college that this Bible is not true? Uh, no, they pretty much ignored the Bible. Uh, but when you listen to what they were teaching, I mean, I had a number of professors who were clearly and proudly Marxist. Yeah. And so, you know, they, they would never talk about things of faith as if they were true or meaningful or significant or relevant. Wow. That, that, that is amazing because t today it's worse. Am I right? Or Oh, gosh, yeah. A lot worse. Yeah. Well, yeah when, we're did, estimating when, that, when, did, when did the change so obviously start taking place? Well, I think what you had in the 50s, 60s, and the 70s was a group of Marxist professors who were training up the next generation of Marxist professors. And then that turned over yet another time. So we're at a point right now where we've had probably three generations of aggressive 
teaching of Marxism at, at the college level. And now, of course, it's penetrating down into the secondary level and the, probably the elementary level to a much greater extent than we know. And, uh, you know, I would estimate that probably you've got 30 to 40 percent of professors in state colleges across the country who are Marxist by background. Isn't this the most shocking thing to someone like yourself that watches it progress and there really looks like no stopping it? Well, it is. It's very disappointing. Uh, and, and I tend to look up at it as a wake up call to the church. It's like, do you recognize that we're in a war? Do you realize that the war has many different facets? And one of those certainly has to do with education. And so the indoctrination process starts very early. You know, Herman, one of the things that I spend most of my time on is worldview research. And one of the things that I try to get Christians in particular to understand is that a person's worldview begins developing at 15 to 18 months of age. And is almost that worldview is almost fully formed by the age of 13. My goodness. Now in churches, what we tend to do is we think, you know, we've really got to concentrate on adults. Well, it's too late by that point. Their worldview is formed. It's in cement. It can be changed. The Holy Spirit can do anything at any time with anybody. But, you know, I'm, I'm basically a sociologist by training. And I look at averages. And on average, people don't change their worldview after the age of 13. They refine it during their teens and 20s. And then they become an evangelist for it in their, in their late 20s and beyond. So as the church, my exhortation is we have to invest most of our resources trying to impact the lives of children, because that's where their worldview is formed. And the worldview basically is nothing more, nothing less than the intellectual, the moral, the spiritual, and emotional filter that we use to make our decisions. And it's going to be influenced by some philosophy of life, which is what we call a worldview. And there are many to choose from. The biblical worldview is the one we want people to choose from. Right. The problem is only 6% of Americans currently have a biblical worldview. What is your core value? For me, it's truth. Uh, and that's, I believe, why God led me into research, is because for me, it's incredibly important to know what's right and what's wrong. What is the truth of a situation? And then to have the privilege to be able to not only find that out, but then to share it with other people, uh, to me, is a very high calling. And that's why I take it so seriously. But people have to get to a place where they recognize truth and they embrace truth. And then they live in accordance with the truth. And of course, truth comes from God. Yeah. God is the embodiment of all truth. Right. And so basically what I'm saying is, yeah, we need to live like Christ. You know, he gave us the model. Let's follow it. Yeah, you just using some of your material, because I've got so much here and I don't want to take up time from you because the reason you're here is I want to hear about what you know, not what I'm reading or what I know. But this is from your 75 percent. You say do not believe that God is the basis of all truth. Seventy five percent. So what? What uh, group does that look like? Well, I mean, that's, that's a broad swath of all Americans, including most people in Christian churches. So we're in a situation where churches have time with people, and they try to communicate influential information to them. But what we tend to do is, is we want them to be happy. And the goal of the church is not to make people happy. It's to instruct them in the ways that they should go so that they can know, love, and serve God with all their heart, mind, strength, and soul. Amen. And so that means that continually we need to be presenting to them elements of what a biblical worldview is. A biblical worldview is a full understanding of God's truth that we can then take and apply in our lives. And we're not doing that in the church across the country. I've done research. Pew has done research. Gallup's done research. A few of us have looked at what are churches actually teaching? And some of it's truth, a lot of it's not truth. Most of it is stories made, uh, told to make us feel good. And the objective here is not to feel good. The objective here is to be Christ-like. 
you, you say Christianity in America, it's rotting from within, inside. Yeah. Where, where do you base that on? Well, there are a number of different ways you can look at that. One is if you evaluate our population and you look at several different segments. Let's say we look at people who regularly attend church, people who could be considered theologically speaking to be born again Christians, uh, you know, people who consider themselves to be Christian, all these different groups. What we know is a majority of them do not believe in absolute moral truth. A majority of them are not living in ways that reflect the ways of Christ. And yet those are the people who we're counting on to go into the broader culture to represent what the Christian life and the Christian worldview, the biblical worldview is all about. Well, the world's getting the wrong idea because the alleged followers of Christ have the wrong idea. You know, so what I prefer to look at are the 6% who actually have a biblical worldview because those are people who understand what the Bible teaches and they do their best to convert it into a lifestyle that reflects uh, a Christian way of living. Is there a denomination know, that that is rotting faster, or is it across the board? Well, we see it pretty much across the board at different rates of rot, if you will. Uh, we do see that happening probably faster in what would be known as the mainline churches. Uh, those are the ones, that, the six predominant mainline churches you know, American Baptist, United Church of Christ, Presbyterian Church, USA, United Methodist, Evangelical Lutheran Church in America. Uh, I'm leaving one out. Oh, the Episcopal Church. Those are the six, uh, what are considered to be mainline churches. And uh, a majority of the churches in each of those denominations do not believe that the Bible can be taken at face value. They would say that we have to add to the scriptures if we want to get to truth but that truth is something that relies on the individual based on his or her experiences and perceptions and desires. That's not, of course, a, a traditional biblical teaching, but that's what those churches would profess. Where you live, there are mega churches, obviously. Yep. Are they getting the message out? And when the people leave that church, do they know what they heard? Well, there are some great mega churches in America, and there are some awful mega churches in America. So, you know, it's just like anything else. You got to look at them one by one. It's hard to, you know, group everything and say, oh, all mega churches are bad, or all mega churches are great, or, gee, they're large. They must be doing something right. One of the, the studies that I've done consistently over the years is asking pastors, is yours a successful and effective ministry? And we find that more than four out of five pastors say, oh, yes. And so then our follow-up question is, uh, what do you base that judgment on? What are the criteria that you use to determine whether or not you're successful and effective in ministry? And we find that most senior pastors in America have five factors that they look at. How many people show up? How many programs are offered? How many staff people have been hired? How much money has been raised? And how much square footage has been built out? Wow. And if those numbers are bigger than they were a year ago, they consider themselves to be growing and successful. And my response to them is that, you know, congratulations. The only problem is Jesus didn't die for any of those things. And so those cannot really be your measures of success. You got to look at what he said made you successful. And that's, are you initiating and growing disciples? What is MTD? Uh, moralistic therapeutic deism. That's is, that, a, is that affecting us today? Oh, gosh. Yeah. I mean, that's a very popular worldview, even though most people have never heard the term. They couldn't define any part of it if you put a gun to their head. Most people don't know it. It's a worldview that's, I think, best described as fake Christianity because it has elements of Christianity in it. You know, that God created the world. God exists today. Uh, you know, Jesus loves people, etc. But then it's got a lot of non-biblical elements as well. God's not involved in our lives. There is no absolute moral truth. God's relying on us to figure out what's right or wrong. These kinds of things that get blended in. And, and this is so typical of Satan and how he works. You give a little bit of truth, you give a bunch of lie. But 
people see that truth and they say, well, I know that's true. I guess the rest of it's true also. That's what moralistic therapeutic deism is. I could go through all the attributes, but it'd be easier just to read them on the website. But people have to be aware of the fact that there's a lot of moralistic therapeutic deism, not only in our culture, but in our churches, and it's leading people astray. Now, are pastors teaching this and the congrega congregation, the congregation does not know it? Uh, they're just saying that sounded good. They don't know the core teaching that the individual is saying. Well, that's part of it. Part of it is that the most influential thing in people's worldview is the media, the arts and entertainment media, the news and information media. Most of the influence on our worldview comes from that particular sector. What we find, frankly, is that churches have very little influence on what people think and do. And so it's mostly the media and the government and family, those three entities, and you could add in their schools as well as part of that government influence. Those are the elements that have the greatest impact on what we believe to be true and right and appropriate. And that gives us our marching orders for how we wanna live. You gotta remember one of the things I always say is that we do what we believe. So beliefs matter a lot. But when we say believe as Christians, we tend to think, oh, the church influences beliefs. Actually, the church is not influencing beliefs nearly as much as other elements of the culture are. The news media, majority liberal, correct? In the mainstream uh, media, yes. Yeah. And, and what does progressive mean to you? To me personally? Yeah. Uh, it, I mean, it, in my mind, when somebody says that, I see a red flag go up. I mean, it's a danger, you know, because progressive basically means that there is no God, that each of us is the God of our own lives, and that we are the ones who are going to have to make the choices, and the basis of those choices is not God's truth, it's not God's love, it's not God's calling, it's personal happiness, personal satisfaction, and those are two diametrically opposed uh, ends of the continuum in most cases. So to me, the, the whole progressive movement is about putting man on the throne rather than God on the throne. Are we a racist nation? Uh, listen, all of us have problems in our life. And there are times when we don't think appropriately about other people whether it's due to their race, their religion, their economic status, their geographic location. I mean, there's all kinds of situations where all of us, because we're human, have inappropriate ideas. Does that make us uh, you know, racist? I, I don't think so. I, I think what we've got to do is dig down and figure out, yeah, what is our belief about humanity? Do I believe that life is a gift from God, that every human being is important? that my calling as a human being is to bless every other human being that I can. If I have that kind of a, a, a mentality, a heart, and there are times when I think poorly of somebody else for whatever reason, that's an error in judgment, that's a sin, that's something that needs to be confessed and changed. But does that make me a, a racist or misogynist or you know whatever ist it is that the left wants to throw at us? Uh, no, I wouldn't say so. Having said that, I know that there are people who despise others simply because of the way they look, the way they sound, you know, whatever it may be. That's clearly wrong what, because what, they, they don't have the heart of God. What did you, in your thinking about adopting children from other parts of the world, did you and your wife sit down and say, do we agree on this? I mean, how did that begin to, to begin your family? Well, we weren't able to have children naturally. So, you know, we believe that it's important for uh, us to be parents, to be raising children, to know and love and serve God. And so we recognize what the options were and adoption is always an option. And there are millions and millions of, of dying children around the world and, and poor children who need a family. So we were pri privileged to be able to you know, adopt two children from Guatemala and one from Russia, who otherwise, just looking at the percentages, would be dead by now. My. Uh, 
you know, and, and so, I mean, what, what an honor for us to be able to take those children, and raise them up to know Christ as they do. What ages were they when you brought them to your home? Uh, we, we were with the mothers of the uh, Guatemalan women while they were pregnant. So we, we helped to, you know, provide the, the medical care and the nourishment and all. But because of the laws of the country, we weren't able to get our first daughter here until she was four months old, second daughter when she was almost 11 months old. The Russian girl was in an, a, a do, uh, what do you call it, uh, an orphanage uh, up until about the age of 10. Wow. And we got her out of there at the age of 10, which we were really blessed to do because we know that at the age of 14 over there, they kicked them out of the orphanages. They have no training, no jobs, no relationships. So they wind up as prostitutes. And the uh, data show that most of them die by the age of 24. My, my, my. What are their ages now? Oh boy, you really tested me on my math today. Uh, 27, uh, 28, and 30. My goodness. All well-educated? Uh, yeah, I mean, they're doing fine. You know, one's managing a company, another one's going on for a master's, you know, I mean, so uh, they're doing well. I mean, they're, they're a credit to society. What does that feel like? You're the individual you and your wife that were led by God to change their entire life. Yeah. You know, I, 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 I guess I tend not to think about that very much. I just see that as part of God's assignment for me and, and we did it and we're working on his assignment for us today, uh, along with, you know, continuing to, to nurture our girls. And of course we've got the three grandchildren. And so we spend a lot of time with them you know, trying to teach them Bible stuff, trying to, you know, encourage them to live a life that would be worthy of the name of Christ. So um, it, it's just an ongoing challenge, an ongoing privilege, and uh, we're, we're pleased to be in that process. We today tend to have a distorted idea of what Christianity is all about. How would you change that perspective? Well, I, I guess I'd start with saying we put too much burden on this thing that we call the local church. We expect the paid professionals to do all the work and we'll sit there and clap and throw money. And the reality is that in the Bible, that entity that mankind has created, known as the local church, doesn't actually exist. What exists are groups of people who know each other, who love Christ, meeting together in homes mm -hmm. and, and encouraging each other and doing things together in the community to represent the ways of God. And so I would say if, 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 if I had the opportunity, I'd want disciples of Christ in America to recognize we've never been called to go to church. We've been called to be the church. So if we want to turn the country around, I can't wait for that building on the corner that has a lot of people in it Sunday morning to do the job. I'm called to do the job. You're called to do the job. Right. Each of us individually and together is the church. And so if things are going to turn around, we actually represent the remnant of God in this culture. And so we have to use every resource that he's entrusted to us for his purposes he doesn't give me money so that I can buy a bigger house and a Porsche. Right. He gives it to me so that I can serve the poor, so that I can get the gospel out into the community, so that I can disciple people who want to be followers of Christ. That's what those resources are for. So, you know, I, I would try to change the mentality of believers to recognize if anything's going to turn around, it depends on you and me. The soon return of Christ, prophecy, that's becoming very popular again. How do you fit that into where we are today? You know, to be honest, Herman, that's not something that I spend a lot of time worrying about. I mean, if God calls a prophet, God bless him or her and let them tell us what God has said. If God hasn't called that individual, I wouldn't want to be in their shoes on judgment day. So, you know, I've got my task that I need to do, and it's not my job to judge others. It's my job to determine truth, given the tools and the opportunities God's given me. And that's what I try to focus on. We have a national audience, been doing this for a long time. 
we you have about three minutes can you speak to that person that is confused about christianity confused about the word of god what the bible is it true is it fake or is it is it some of it's good some of it's bad speak to that audience yeah i mean it's it's a great situation to be in because you're thinking through and making the choice that's going to determine the rest of your eternity and and what a great privilege that is to have god allow you to make that decision and in order to make it you've got to realize that he wants to help us in that and so he gave us some guidance that's what we call the bible the bible is god speaking to us through other people who knew him and love him and were serving him in the way that they were called to do and so if you look at the bible there's more historical evidence of its truth of its accuracy than any other document that's ever been written and there are more prophecies in the bible that have been shown over the course of hundreds and hundreds of years to be true simply as verification of the fact that yes this is truth this is god's truth for us he gave it to us so that we can thrive because that's what god wants us to do he wants us to thrive in this life so he gave us the parameters and the conditions under which that can happen and one of the great things that God talks about in there is the fact that even though we are sinners, there's an antidote for that sin, and that's Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. He himself came down in the form of a man who we know is Jesus Christ. It was God in flesh who came down here to save us from our sins. And so if you are willing to accept Jesus Christ as your savior, you know, recognizing that you need a savior because you're a sinner, all of us are sinners, we all need a savior. Not everybody goes that route, but those who do ultimately will be saved by Christ as we accept him as our Lord and savior. And as we try to live in accordance with those principles that God gave us in his word. When we do that, we will be persecuted by the world because it's threatened by that. Right. People want to think that they're in charge. The reality is we didn't create ourselves. God created us. We're not here just to be happy. We're here for his purposes. Yeah. And so it's a great opportunity to, to know and to love and to serve God with our all of our heart and all of our mind, all of our soul, so that we really bring honor to God because that's ultimately what we're going to wind up doing for eternity is Dr. being George, in his presence and enjoying it. Dr. George Barner, thank you a thousand times over. God bless you. Thank you, Herman. It's been great to be with you. Appreciate you so much. Thank you.